My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS that looks after our Europe and Eurasia work. And uh, uh, we have been very excited about uh, this uh, conversation and this working paper that our super duper adjunct fellow Kati Sominen has put together um, looking at aid for E-Trade. So you're probably wondering why is a Europe program looking at aid for E-Trade? We have been doing here at CSIS and uh, along with my colleague Scott Miller and others, we've been looking at the transatlantic trade space. Uh, obviously for the transatlantic trade and investment uh, partnership, uh, it's a huge pillar uh, of our work, but rather than just talking about TTIP in more generic terms and on our support for it, we wanted to dive deeply into really what was, uh, what was changing within that transatlantic space and certainly data, online training, uh, trading, in our view, was one of those key areas we wanted to take a look at. And very gratefully, um, Kati uh, joined uh, CSIS and helped us think through some very new and exciting ideas uh, in this space. Uh, this project would not have been possible without the generous support of eBay and helping us uh, think through and some of the key issues they uh, were looking at. And it was a, it's a great partnership, and we're looking forward to, again, uh, thanking our, our colleague, uh, Usman Ahmed, who's uh, not arrived yet, but who's been a, a great partner with us. So we have a terrific panel uh, of, of experts to help us think through this question. Kati's going to present her working paper, the outlines of that working paper, and then we're going to have our panel uh, talk about from their perspective uh, and their particular, um, uh, whether that's from a private sector, think tank, um, uh, an international financial institute, how are they looking at E-Trade and looking at specifically some of the ideas that Kati has put forward in her new working paper. So I'm going to get out of your way, but I just want to briefly introduce our, our panelists before we begin. Of course, uh, Kati in her role as adjunct fellow uh, with CSIS, but she's also the founder and CEO of the equity crowdfunding platform Trade Up Capital Fund, and she's also uh, the CEO of, the, of a trade research firm, Next Trade Group, and in her spare time, of which I do not believe she has much, she is an adjunct professor at UCLA's Anderson School of Management, and she's just been a fabulous partner. Kati, thank you so much. After Kati gives her overview, we're going to turn the floor over to Dr. Joshua Meltzer, who's just around the corner, a uh, fellow in global economy and development at Brookings Institution, and he too is an adjunct professor at, uh, at SAIS and a reviewer of the Journal of Politics and Law. Josh focuses on international trade law and policy issues, a great deal of focus on the WTO and free trade agreements. And then we have Jennifer Sanford, Senior Manager of International Trade and Energy Environment Policy at Cisco Global Policy and Government Affairs. Jen has, been, has an, an outstanding and long-serving career in the international trade space. Prior to her work at Cisco, she was Director of International Trade Policy at the American Electronics Association and has done an enormous amount of work on uh, Trade Promotion Authority in 2002 and working on a variety of, of, of instruments, uh, PNTR, China's PNTR and other things. So we're delighted that, Jen, you could be with us. And last but certainly not least, we have Fabrizio Aperti, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Fabrizio. Uh, Fabrizio is the Chief of Trade and Investment Unit at the end of, okay. Chief of the Trade and Investment Unit of the Integration and Trade Sector at the Inter-American Development Bank. I clearly need more coffee, but that's a great title. Um, and Fabrizio has uh, done an enormous amount of work looking at the international trade and foreign direct investment promotion uh, and technical cooperation projects at the IDB. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing more about what the IDB has been up to in this space as well. This report uh, was first started with an exciting working group uh, that we held uh, in a meeting, we held a workshop here at CSA several months ago. We had folks like uh, Ralph Carter from FedEx, um, Martha Lawless from the International Trade Commission. We had some colleagues from the World Bank as well from eBay and others. So this is truly a brainstorming team effort and Kati is the brain and the master behind it. So with that, Kati, over to you. Thank you for being here, um, and to echo Heather, um, thank you Heather, first of all, for a great partnership, and um, uh, 
for eBay's gener generous support. This has been a wonderful collaboration with eBay, uh, both in terms of the intellectual content and, uh, and, and supporting us in this journey. So, so really appreciate it. Why don't I um, give you sort of the basics of the, of the report, and then we can turn to our panel uh, for, for comments and broader discussion with all of you. Um, what I would basically do is to divide this in three parts. One is to discuss the opportunity that uh, e-commerce represents for uh, companies and, and consumers around the world and international trade. The second is to discuss the challenges uh, that we're facing to, to the rise of e-commerce and growth of e-commerce globally. And the, and the third area is this idea of aid for e-trade, how to catalyze, how to accelerate the rise of e-commerce uh, for the benefit of, of the global trading system, for world trade, and for uh, small businesses in particular. So to go um, uh, to the opportunity, um, some of you may have seen some of these data. It's actually quite striking. Um, E-commerce has grown extremely rapidly in the US economy as well as in the global economy. Uh, between 2006 and 2012, um, almost doubled e-commerce in the United States. This uh, Commerce Department, uh, US Census uh, Bureau data on, on e-commerce. Much of e-commerce is still business to business transactions. Uh, about 12% in the US is uh, business to uh, consumers. But what is um, impressive about this is that e-commerce is by now $5 trillion, $6 trillion um, in, in value, which is equivalent to a third of US GDP. So. So uh, a dramatic expansion. The same happens globally. Uh, so e-commerce has, if you, if you start to think about it, has grown four times faster than the world economy over the past number of years. Um, if you count the, give a quite uh, generous counting to global GDP growth. Uh, and this only shows the B2C uh, e-commerce sales. So. Uh, these are only perhaps 10% of all e-commerce sales globally. It's hard to get data on the B2B e-commerce, so, so using this B2C um, and, and dramatic growth at 20% double-digit rates uh, globally. Um, what's exciting to all of us in, in the trade arena is that a big component, big share of the overall um, e-commerce around the world is cross-border. And if you look further to 2017, um, several years out, five years out, um, an increasing amount of e-commerce around the world is in fact cross-border. So it's in, in fact you know, trade between uh, nations. 20 to 40 percent, depending on the region, is, is cross-border uh, um, of, of the total flows of e-commerce. Um, and um, the the growth of cross-border e-commerce is very dramatic. So in certain countries and, and regions like East Asia, uh, China, uh, is growing absolutely radically. So between 2013, 2018, e-commerce um, in China is um, growing fourfold. Um, and if you, if you really put the numbers together, e-commerce is growing five times faster than, than the growth of world trade. So it's it's very dramatic expansion, particularly in the emerging markets. The figures are a little less in the advanced economies because it's it's more saturated already um, in terms of the uh, penetration of e-commerce. But, but in Brazil, China, other emerging economies, absolutely dramatic uh, growth. Now, why are we so excited about this? Well, one um, key reason is that e-commerce opens tremendous opportunities for the so far marginal participants in trade the small businesses, um, you know, garage entrepreneurs, individual consumers, to really participate and direct the flow of international trade. As you know, a lot of um, bulk of world trade is still driven by the large giant corporations. So in any one country, maybe, you know, one or two percent of companies, of the largest companies, uh, run or uh, contribute probably half, 60 percent, 70 percent to this country's trade. And if you look at the export participation, as here in the figure, of um, uh, companies in exporting, or in, in world trade, it's still a minority. Minority in any, almost in any one country, only a minority of companies export. You know, we've been hearing a lot about how ubiquitous globalization is. Well, it's not. Uh, most companies don't export. In the United States, 300,000 companies um, export. What's that? That's 1% of US SMEs. And if you count uh, only employee, employment uh, providing SMEs, then you're talking about 5%. So it's still a minority of companies. 
What happens if you look at only the companies that sell on eBay and are so-called technology enabled? Well, almost 100% in every economy, almost 100% of those companies um, export. Dramatic difference to the online world, absolutely striking. And even if you were to say, well, hey, let's look at the United States, a lot of these companies that do not export are probably services companies. Well, if you just take the manufacturing firms in the US, the figure of exporters is probably 20, uh, 25% still. Uh, of middle market companies in the US that are more likely to export than small businesses, 40% export. So any, any which way you slice this figure, um, it's, it's a dramatic difference between online and offline um, exporters. And um, it's very exciting to see that, um, that uh, e-commerce kind of enables companies to, to uh, engage in trade that uh, they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And why is this? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is the visibility between buyers and sellers that e-commerce provides. It's uh, one, of the, one of the great hurdles to trade is the distance between buyer and seller located far apart. And e-commerce enables companies to be much more visible, uh, enables products to be visible, and in fact enables companies to be discovered by the foreign buyer. So oftentimes, uh, a company on, uh, that sells online becomes discovered by, an, um, uh, by a foreign buyer and kind of accidentally becomes an exporter. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that if you look at a little deeper, this is um, uh, eBay data on Chilean firms, uh, of companies in Chile, again, comparing the technology-enabled companies that sell on uh, online platforms versus the offline sellers. So another dramatic difference between the two uh, sets of companies is that the um, number of destinations, the export diversification in terms of market diversification of online sellers is dramatically uh, higher than for offline sellers. So for Chilean companies, the typical company, uh, Fabrizio knows this well, exports probably to one to two countries, one, two, three or countries, uh, whereas the online seller exports to an average of 28 countries. I incredible uh, diversification for, for companies. If you look at uh, the survival rate, uh, su survival rates of entrants, i.e. companies that uh, engage in trade for the first time in year one, do they still export in year two? Do they survive uh, into export in year two or three? Typical company does not. Only 30% of companies in Chile, and this is very much the same data around the world, survive in the export game. Most of them don't export after, they may have a few export transactions in a given year and then they you know, stop uh, in the second year. Online, again, the difference is striking. 80% survive. Uh, they continue exporting. And what does this do to a country? Well, these survivor, uh, survivors or sustained exporters are key to the growth of export volumes. So e-commerce provides both market diversification, export diversification, as well as um, uh, export-led growth. Very exciting data. Um, so just to summarize the opportunity here, e-commerce increases uh, export participation, particularly the smaller uh, companies that have so far been been um, um, outsiders to the international trading system uh, propels export diversification, increases export volumes, and of course, it's good for all of us. Uh, we get a uh, greater variety of products, uh, greater quality of products at better prices. So how do we accelerate this? In a way, you might ask, well, you know, we saw that e-commerce is growing globally, but why isn't it global already? Why is it still maybe 10% of all world trade? Uh, it's, it's still not uh, quite as global as we would like, and certainly the penetration of e-commerce is not the same in um, uh, emerging markets as it is in the, in the transatlantic arena, uh, say. So how, what do we do? What's the challenge here? Well, there are a number of challenges that come through the work that Josh and uh, Jen and others have been uh, doing. Uh, one is uh, just to go through this uh, quickly. A lot of you have uh, read about this. Uh, digital protectionism, data protectionism, a um, number of issues there, uh, data flows uh, across borders, all of these hamper the participation of uh, e-commerce platforms, of companies in, in um, e-trade. And if you drill further down, data, um, we're talking a lot about trade, uh, data flows in this town, data is a critical ingredient, if you will, to a number of services and goods 
that are being traded across borders. So as, as uh, governments restrict access to data, they also increase the cost of, of uh, goods and services. And so this is basically a, a very much uh, acts as a tariff and, and reduces, um, it has a, actually negative implications to GDP uh, growth in countries, has empirically been shown. Um, what, what comes through in uh, surveys in uh, emerging markets in particular is that the security and ease of online payments uh, is a major problem uh, for, for small companies to transact online. Uh, consumers just don't believe that um, uh, their personal data online is safe. They don't necessarily trust in online payment systems. And these are uh, come, come through surveys as one of some of the major challenges for the spread of uh, e-commerce. Uh, there are trade compliance costs. For, you know, we're talking about a very different uh, um, set of participants in trade than, than ever in the past, where probably the importer of record is an individual consumer, and the exporter is a, you know, could be a, a company run by two or three people. Now, these people have very um, much more limited capacities to comply with trade regulations, all the complex um, uh, rules than uh, even mid-sized companies do. Uh, there are distribution shipping issues in emerging markets, um, and um, certainly then digital divides. So the, sort of the traditional digital divides probably are the key, and Jen, you can uh, pick up on this, are probably the key to the spread of um, e-commerce uh, globally. Uh, the ICT infrastructures are still poor in particularly the LDCs, uh, Africa, Middle East, developing Asia. Um, and then in a number of economies, there is kind of the second digital divide, which is that they may have a good I ICT system. They may be quite connected, but they haven't translated those um, connectivity, their connectivity to economic gains. And this includes kind of the emerging markets, Eastern Europe. So to paint a picture here, this is uh, data from the World Economic Forum. Um, on the x-axis are the economic impacts from ICT. What do countries actually, do they actually translate these gains from ICT connectivity into economic impacts? And on the y-axis, you have the ICT infrastructure quality. So here um, at the bottom are poor, poor uh, countries with poor ICT infrastructure quality and of course low economic gains, and it's typically the African countries, sub-Saharan African countries, that tend to be there in the, in the uh, uh, bottom left-hand side. And here are a set of countries with um, rather good ICT infrastructure, but still countries that derive low economic gains from their connectivity. And this includes a number of the Eastern European countries that Heather uh, deals with, uh, Latin American countries Fabrizio deals with, so this is, uh, this is probably not uh, surprising data for, for you all, but, but it, there is a, a much to be done on both sets to um, raise their game and get them up to where the advanced economies are at the, at the top right-hand corner. Uh, one of the reasons, perhaps, for the low uh, gains in, um, in translating ICT uh, connectivity uh, into economic gains and trade gains is that SMEs are still not that connected. Uh, to, to, to the web. They do quite a bit. This is uh, data from the World Bank. They do quite a bit of emailing and, and so forth with their clients. But if you ask them, well, do you have your own website, let alone, well, do you sell you know, uh, products uh, through online platforms or, or your own, own uh, e-commerce platform, the answer is more likely to be no than yes. So there's much work to be done here, um, uh, particularly in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, but certainly in Latin America as well. Uh, there's, there's quite a, there, there's potential to have these figures at much higher uh, levels. Now, so how do, we, how do we solve some of these challenges? How, how do we tackle the, um, the problems that are there confronting us in them and blocking and uh, decelerating, if you will, arresting the potential of e-commerce? Um, we uh, came up with Heather uh, with this concept of aid for e-trade. And um, what is perhaps different about this is that this is the, the kind of a comprehensive initiative. Uh, the idea here is to be, you know, uh, focus minds of the donor community right on the back of some of the momentum in trade integration that we see in TTIP, uh, TPP, in other regions of the world. 
um, and, and to channel resources, much like Aid for Trade initiative has done over the past decade. Uh, Aid for Trade, as all of you know, has channeled $200 billion in developing countries, particularly in infrastructure, um, boosting their productive capacity and so forth uh, in the past, um, over the past decade. And the spirit here is very much the same. So why not uh, take a focused initiative on um, E-Trade alone, uh, which has not been the focus of uh, Aid for Aid for Trade. If you look at the numbers, uh, kind of e-commerce, e-trade related projects have been perhaps 1% of that 200 billion. Um, and so our idea here is to, to boost that figure significantly and have a focused initiative only on e-commerce, uh, given that it is an arena of, of its own uh, challenges, its own um, opportunities. So one goal here could be $100 billion in the next five years uh, in boosting e-commerce. The spirit of this is very much a public-private partnership. Uh, there are a number of stakeholders, um, such as I would um, you know, suggest eBay, uh, probably uh, Jen agrees with this, uh, uh, private sector partners that could work with public sector entities like the developing banks in furthering um, um, uh, investments in, uh, in projects that catalyze e-commerce. Uh, this could be conditioned on free and open internet policies so that countries that adhere to um, open internet and, and a good kind of internet governance would uh, be the ones that receive the, tr receive the, the benefits and receive the funding uh, very much in the spirit of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And this could ride on the momentum that we have uh, of FTAs. Uh, oftentimes, trade agreements give great momentum for development-related work and development-related projects. We've seen this in NAFTA. We've seen this in CAFTA in particular. Um, and uh, why, not, why not in this arena? And we have exciting initiatives like the Pacific Alliance in Latin America. Uh, APEC has had a long-standing focus on, uh, on SMEs as well as on e-commerce. Uh, could be another arena. TPP certainly uh, has developing countries, uh, developed countries that would benefit from increased uh, e-commerce and, and um, uh, TTIP as well. Uh, why not, right? Eastern European countries are still behind uh, the curve, so uh, TTIP could be used to catalyze them and pilot this, perhaps. And, and Jen was actually one that suggested this, so you might pick up on that. Uh, some of the key focus areas uh, that Aid for E-Trade could, could um, play a role in uh, very much like aid for trade, uh, capacity building to leverage e-commerce. So there's a lot of e-training needed for uh, small businesses um, in, in developing countries to really learn to use uh, e-commerce, uh, uh, use their connectivity for, for trading across borders. It's not as simple as it, as it, uh, as it seems. It's not only putting your product up on an uh, e eBay platform or Mercado Libre or something like that. Uh, there are a number of um, you know, issues related to product labeling, pricing, localization, um, uh, positioning, you name it. It's their advertisement, uh, marketing online that uh, small businesses also have to master if they are to be successful in exporting through online, online platforms. Um, another focus area could be uh, guaranteeing safe and high quality payments, uh, online payment systems. This is really a bottleneck in emerging markets, so, so it should be a key focus. Uh, and again, a ri area rife for public-private partnerships um, as well. Uh, trade compliance uh, issues, we actually are working on another paper here with uh, Heather uh, related to this, uh, this very topic. Um, uh, of course, distribution shipping is quite antiquated. We feel like a distribution and shipping globally is, it works wonderfully, but there are still a lot of inefficiencies in that, um, in that uh, uh, process. So that could also be um, catalyzed uh, and, and improved through investments in, uh, in e-commerce. Uh, and finally, there could be policy advice, just this you know, standard policy advice for countries, particularly perhaps in the, in the LDCs and, and uh, lower end of the spectrum on internet governance and, and e-commerce policies. And um, uh, these five points perhaps are best for countries that are, number one, have those good internet policies in place, but second, that already have some you know, uh, capacity and infrastructure. Uh, there's another set of countries altogether that lack infrastructure, so that's kind of the 
the, of course, the necessary, uh, necessary area to address uh, in the beginning. So let me conclude with this. Uh, what do we have to decide on if we're uh, pursuing this as, a, as the international community, as perhaps the US government or, or um, any other set of actors? Is the priority countries. What do we focus first on? Uh, we have maybe suggested here that uh, the, the focus could be on the lower hanging fruit, countries that are already uh, have overcome some of the infrastructure bottlenecks and, and, and now are um, in a place where they could take better advantage of their connectivity. Um, another important issue to, to decide on is monitoring and evaluation of uh, these projects. Uh, Aid for Trade has actually had a, a major problem here in this area. Projects have not been monitored uh, as well as they could. Um, membership, also in kind of multi-stakeholder coalitions, who is going to participate, uh, uh, private sector partners, foundations, governments, and so forth, how to manage these coalitions, another, um, another challenge to, to work through. And um, uh, then the coordination of the initiative uh, is also critical. Aid for Trade has been coordinated by the WTO and OECD. Uh, perhaps here is a place for a multilateral development bank like the World Bank, IDB, ADB coming together with the WTO. Could be a rather powerful uh, combination in my, uh, in my opinion. And uh, then there could be a starting point. Could be a Pacific Alliance, could be uh, TPP, could be TTIP as, as a kind of a pilot uh, from which we learn and uh, from which we grow forward. Um, and one area, um, one idea we had in the paper to, to leave you off with, one idea is, is a platform um, that gathers uh, data on, on information, data and information on e-commerce investments, e-commerce policies, uh, policy barriers on e-commerce, and policy innovations as well. That informs um, the world uh, as to what's going on in e-commerce. I've yet to see anything like this, and this could be a very, uh, very useful complementary tool to the to the idea. So, so thank you very much. I've gone on for a long time, and I very much look forward to the to the panel. Kati, thanks so much. It was a super overview, and it's a very exciting report. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I commend it to you. Josh. Great, thanks. Um, and Kati, thank you for um, you know, the paper and the presentation. It's a very um, wealth, rich paper with a lot of um, information in there, a lot of great, I think, um, policy ideas and, and proposals, and I think gives us all a lot to, to work with and to, and to think about and to talk about. Um, going forward. I, I'm being asked to speak um, you know, fairly briefly, and so I'll, I'll do that. Um, I think one of the things that comes out of, of your presentation, Cardi, and, and, and something I just want to talk about a bit more briefly is, firstly, the importance of platforms. Um, you know, because, I mean, you, you were speaking a lot about eBay, and obviously there's, the, eBay's been great in terms of giving opportunities to small enterprises to export, and, and of course there are other platforms um, which are becoming, um, you know, competitive and also significant in the US and, and in other countries. And I think that one of the things that comes from this is uh, the idea that, firstly, the opportunities become economy-wide. So, um, you know, we're talking about small and medium-sized enterprises, we're talking about goods, we're also talking about services um, often as well, where there's a, a lot of key opportunities there. Um, and, you know, the way that the globalisation of the internet and access to it has really had an impact on uh, businesses and economic sectors, which are not really IT anymore. So the IT now is being understood essentially as sort of a supporting framework, um, and it is sort of using that framework to uh, become global, which I think is often a really key message, because often um, you know, the IT infrastructure is, um, you know, at times you get governments who see the IT infrastructure as being very American, um, for instance, and, and the point, I think, is that, um, you know, this is not about um, an American business model necessarily, it's about giving the rest of your economy the opportunity to actually use these services, use these platforms uh, to go global. I think that's a really important message that certainly comes out of your paper as well. I think the other thing which is really interesting about this is how much of this, in a way, is consumer-driven in, in a way which is a slightly different to the way we normally think about just commerce and international trade generally, because you can be, I guess, on eBay, take it as an example, and you know, you may not necessarily set yourself up as an international trader, an international company, but if it happens to be the case that someone from Canada or China or wherever, you know, gets online and purchases your goods, suddenly you're an international trader. Um, so, you know, and you, I think this is like part of the, um, 
the crux of your um, thinking here is, you know, we need to we need solutions both at sort of the business end and in a way at the consumer end, which you know is different to the way we've normally been thinking about enabling consumers because they are going to, to some extent, drive the patterns of trade um, more than the strategic thinking of the businesses, which is normally generally been the case. And then you obviously get into the situation that you get an order from another country and then you have to be able to fulfil it and you run into all these challenges of do I have the payments, etc., set up and can I get it to that country in time and, and all of those um, costs which are still there, which are important, which still need to be addressed. So, you know, it's I just uh, thinking about this, I guess, from the consumer end, clearly, I mean, one of the things that's happening which is um, very important here is the growth in internet access. There's about four billion people still in the world who do not have internet access. Most of these are in the in the developing world, and by you know the ITU estimates that internet access will double by 2020. Obviously, most of that growth will be in the developing world. You made the point that um, there is sort of saturation in a sense in the developed world, so you would expect that growth to be there. And you combine this, obviously, with very large growing middle classes um, in Asia and elsewhere, and that's, I think, where the beginning of the opportunity certainly lies. Um, the other trend, and, you know, Cisco's got some great data on this, is the extent that this, um, the accessing of the internet is going to be on smart devices and on mobile devices. And so that's going to both generate data, which you, you mentioned, um, and it's also a completely different way of interacting with the internet and the way of consuming on the internet, which is also going to change <coughs> patterns of trade in fairly significant ways, which I think we're really probably only beginning to understand and think through. So um, just one example, uh, in the developing world broadly, um, sort of access to smart devices is expected to double um, in the in the next sort of three or four years, which, which is fairly significant. I mean, the, the, the penetration is already fairly high in the in the developed world, and then we get into interesting ideas such as Internet of Things, um, which the the access of smart devices and global data flows is going to sort of underpin. And there are a lot of I think emerging opportunities not only in the United States but in Europe um, for for building on that and the types of consumption patterns that are going to change. Again, I think importantly in the services area in particular, but also certainly on the good side, um, big data which we talk about and the opportunities both commercially and, and otherwise that are going to come from that are also going to be um, significant. Um, so the other thing which I think is a, a really interesting part of what's happening here is the sort of you talked about the B2B bit, which I think is really key here because, um, you know, one of the possibly undeveloped opportunities here is still the opportunity for businesses to use the internet to access inputs themselves, often services but at times goods, um, to improve their productivity, their competitiveness and their capacity to then also engage in international trade. In a sense, there's... Uh, possibly a win-win situation for the United States at least, which clearly has, you know, a comparative advantage when it comes to sophisticated services being provided online, um, you know, providing that to developing world businesses, um, which can then improve their own competitiveness and productivity and then engage in the next stage of selling to consumers. And <laughs> all of this can be enabled online and it gets, you know, back to, I think, the framework you talk about in your aid for e-trade proposal where you need to build up the bottom-up internet capacity, the internet access and, and the like to actually enable that to happen. Um, the, the, the other bit which um, is, is going on as well, obviously, in the B2B space, I guess, is that we have commercial transactions. We have a lot of, um, I guess, internal business-driven activity which isn't being picked up in a lot of the trade data and the trade statistics, which is still important and, and from a policy perspective, I guess, is also hard to get at because the data is um, not there in a sense. And there's so whether we're talking about managing um, sort of supply chains or the type of R&D and um, collaboration that the internet enables to happen globally, um, this is an increasingly important business activity which the internet is allowing. Um, and as you build it out in the developing world, the opportunity for um, developing world businesses to be part of that process grows and I think that's another opportunity there which certainly I think your proposal can help at getting at. 
I think when, when we think about the aid for e trade, the only thing I want to, um, you, you know, you had a very comprehensive uh, list of and you know, ideas in terms of building out the opportunities for SMEs, particularly in the developing world, to engage in e-commerce. One of the things, um, you know, and you, you, you do mention this, that, that um, seems to come up as one of the issues here is um, one, even once you've got the internet access, you need to obviously build out both the sort of the literacy, the skills in that area, and then you also run into issues to do with language. And Fabrizio, you probably come across this a bit in Latin America. You certainly see this in, um, in Asia, where the internet still um, coming out of obviously you know, the United States in particular, um, but other parts of the world is, 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 is driven by English. And so the capacity for small businesses in non-English speaking countries to really benefit from the internet is, is a simple thing in a way, um, but actually not a simple thing to address necessarily. Um, but it's certainly, I think, part of the picture there. The other thing which is, I think, uh, a issue which bubbles under the surface implicitly, sometimes quite explicitly, is this issue of trust. And yeah, different countries and different consumers have different ways of thinking of this. If you talk to Europe at the moment, you know, this all gets framed in terms of what happened with Snowden and the security angle. Mm -hmm. um, other um, parts of the world who were, who were less concerned about that just think about it in terms of the, the security of, of their, their data, their, their information. This is where privacy um, becomes a significant issue. And so building out a framework which is going to allow consumers and businesses who don't have the opportunity essentially to meet each other to trust each other and to make that transaction as well, I think is going to be a really key part of sort of the social environment which is going to make this possible. There's, F, I think this, people are aware of this, there's obviously some attempt through trust to trademarks and, and the like, but this is still very nascent and early and it certainly hasn't been globalised and this could be part of also a way of thinking about the aid for E-Tray concept um, to get at that issue at least. I'm not going to talk, you've, talk, you've spoken, I think you, know, you gave a great overview of the types of sort of policy opportunities um, that are out there. There's obviously the free trade um, agreement negotiations where you can do some work on this, both at the sort of internet access data flow end as well as possibly building it into the sort of aid for e-trade um, scope of it and bringing in multilateral institutions um, into that space. I think um, I think it's a really great place. So I just commend you on your paper and um, thank you for doing it. Josh, that was great. Thank you so much, Jen. Please. Thank you very much, and thank you to Heather and Kathy uh, for including me and um, appreciate being here. It's really an honor to to be at CSIS. Um, I too uh, commend the paper. I think it's it's very well done, and it focuses on um, some outcomes. That, um, that we're very passionate about at Cisco. Um, and I personally am very passionate about the diffusion of technology around the world um, to uh, promote social, economic, and, and even environmental benefits. Um, what's amazing is that only 1% of the devices in the world are actually connected to the internet. And so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity um, to connect more of the unconnected. Um, and it's not just things, um, but also people and processes um, and, and, and data and things in which um, Cisco talks about the internet of everything, not just the internet of things. Um, because adding the people and the processes in um, the, really adds value to those connections. Um, we've estimated that between 2013 and 2022, that there's $19 trillion of net new economic value that's up for grabs um, with the advent of the Internet of Everything. And so I think, um, as you're saying, the pie is getting bigger, uh, and that's really exciting because these technologies are being adopted uh, and utilized not just in the United States but in developing countries as well. So how does that... Um, how does that relate to your paper? Uh, I was, I mean, I, I really kind of ravaged through your paper. I thought it was very, um, very, very interesting data, very helpful data. And um, I think the idea here is how can we focus our investments and focus our policy agenda? I, I focus on policy mostly, and so I'm going to talk 
from a policy end probably a little bit more um, than perhaps others um, to accelerate the adoption of, um, of the Internet of Everything and the, the idea of aid for trade in getting smaller businesses in particular, but also other businesses around the world um, using the Internet as a means of engaging in global commerce. Um, <coughs> um, with respect to the, the challenges, I was really struck by one of the statistics in your paper about that 90% of small, um, small and medium-sized enterprises use the Internet and only 18% reported making online sales. Um, and, uh, and so there clearly is a disconnect between I, you know, I have a smartphone or I have connect, a connectivity to the Internet and am I actually using the Internet to engage in online sales. Um, but uh, as Josh had suggested, there are, and, and Kati, there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of productivity gains that are, um, that are realized as a result of um, using Internet technologies. Um, so we at Cisco look at sort of the total picture of the different types of connections that are made, um, the, the machine to machine connections and the Internet of Things, um, the people to people connections, um, as well as the people to machine connections. And we see that the Internet is this vast ecosystem of connections from software that creates data, that gets transmitted, um, that goes into the network, that then rides on a physical infrastructure, right? And so you have this <clears throat> internet stack, if you will, and coordinating all of that um, is quite extraordinary that it happens, <laughs> number one. Um, but number two, there are opportunities, there are a lot of opportunities um, for challenges to, to, um, to come into play. So you talk about data protection and privacy, um, security and ease of online payments, as well as this digital divide. And um, while I agree with those, those challenges, I think there are other challenges as well, um, including, and you had mentioned, it's interesting, you mentioned internet governance and you mentioned ecosystem, but I think we need to make sure that those ideas are brought into sort of the policy agenda so that, <coughs> so that the challenges are addressed by, um, by policies that change in order to um, create the reality you're looking for. So um, internet governance is, is clearly a very important aspect of um, internet policy today where we want to maintain the multi-stakeholder system um, that's used to run the internet um, as we know it. Um, standards and interoperability um, are also really important things to keep an eye on. None of this works without um, uh, industry-led standards and interoperability among the different stacks. Uh, technology stacks, that is, and so um, so I would hope that that, that would be an aspect um, uh, to keep an eye on and make sure that in in talking with these governments about what types of um, internet governance and e-commerce policies to erect, that we also have kind of a robust um, uh, policy agenda, including spectrum policy. Um, harmonized spectrum is very important. Um, mundane things like duties and taxes. I think you had talked about trade compliance, but we really need to get those remaining sort of de minimis um, issues dealt with, particularly for smaller shipments. Um, trade facilitation and customs, very excited that the trade facilitation agreement is back on track and that we're gonna look forward to implementation there. I think that's in particular gonna help many developing countries um, to align their trade, trading systems, if you will, um, to, to the global trading system, provide from some harmonization, and of course export controls. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, that there are certain technologies um, that uh, cannot be exported, at least from the United States or, or re-exported from another country, um, without certain trade controls. And so I think that's an important part of piece of the compliance um, uh, aspect of this that, that needs to really be taken into account. So in my view, the digital trade agenda is all of those things, right? It's, it's, um, protection, uh, it's addressing the data protectionism and localization, um, forced localization issues, 
requiring companies to process or store data in a particular country. Um, I thought Josh was right on in mentioning um, security and trust. Um, this, this is an issue that um, needs to be addressed multilaterally, um, and we need to probably incubate it, and I, I'm very interested to see what happens in TTIP with the Safe Harbor Agreement on the, on the margins. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, I like your idea of export promotion for small businesses, and I'm, I'm very interested in um, uh, the, particularly um, your, your suggestion of using technology in order to assure trade compliance and, um, uh, you know, uh, to facilitate that kind of trade. The conditionality I thought was a great idea as well. Um, and um, with respect to coordination, you had talked about several different lending institutions, and I was, I was, it just dawned on me that perhaps um, including the IFC um, would, could also be um, a useful mechanism to make sure that there is that focus on developing countries and that link with the World Bank. Um, so, and your commons idea is a very interesting idea. I think it's a way to actually scale this over time because as you say, it's gonna be, you're gonna have to pick some priority countries and see how things go and get some lessons learned. Um, but it's a way of, um, of capturing those lessons learned and then what works can be scaled from that. Um, so I guess one, one question I had, um, and which I, I think maybe would be ripe for discussion here was what would be the measure of success for, um, would it be seeing those small SME numbers that are engaged in trade go up um, relative to the overall growth of um, e-commerce trade? Or what, what is your measure of success here? Because um, I think that's, hap that's, um, that's important to, to, to be mindful of. And you talked about metrics and measure and, um, monitoring. Um, so happy to discuss and take questions. Thanks. Jen, thanks so much. Fabrizio. Thanks, Heather, and <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored. Um, trying to add um, to the, the thoughts and reflections before, I think technology and trade and, and SMEs uh, really undermines many of our traditional assumptions, uh, especially regarding the smaller players. Usually we've said that in economic literature and the small guys, the small companies, they're improductive. They don't have the economies of scale, they don't have the financial resources, they don't have the managerial acumen and expertise in order to export. So really they're improductive and they're paria in the international trade um, area. And that with technology and with e-commerce, uh, that is uh, not holding truth. Uh, whereas it, it, on, on one hand, we see that the uh, smaller players don't export as much, of course, the, Big companies are the ones that export. Um, in Cathy's paper, only 1% of um, 30 million SMEs in the US have traditional export. But as many as 97% of US companies are selling on eBay export. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have, um, McKinsey talks about the micro multinationals. The small companies born out of a garage in Argentina that are born global. Um, there's a Guatemalan firm. Uh, we were in Guatemala last week. We do um, a global a services globalization trade event, technical and matchmaking. It's the fourth edition. Um, uh, outsourced to LAC, outsourced to Latin America and the Caribbean. Talking services, uh, technology, software, BPO, ITO, uh, engineering, video games, uh, architecture, the export of services. And a little company out of Guatemala did the animation for a Hollywood film, Narnia, okay? That was done out of Guatemala. Uh, the kids, many of you uh, don't have kids yet, many of you do. <laughs> uh, you know, they play the, the video game um, 
soccer, FIFA, FIFA 2013, 14, they keep changing it. And it's, it's very well done. That's out of Buenos Aires, out of the outskirts of Buenos Aires. That's where it's done. Globant is, is that firm that, that does that. And of course, exports um, globally. Um, a Uruguayan architectural firm, firm uh, designed uh, the, the, the headquarters in, in Bangalore uh, for TCS, for Tata Consulting Services, uh, because the, Mr. Tata went to Uruguay and really liked the building there, the free trade zone in Zona America. So um, really, the, the, the globalization uh, poses uh, many great uh, opportunities and defies uh, especially technology and services, many of our um, traditional thinking. In, in Latin America, actually, there's some elements uh, which are very exciting. Um, almost half of the Latin Americans have internet access. Uh, actually, internet access grew between 2000 and 2014 900% in, in, in the regions, one of the fastest growing regions in the world. And we are sociable people. But we're social online. Um, the, the region is, they spend, Latin Americans spend twice as time, twice much as time as the rest of the world in social uh, media. Um, and 60% of those social media users are age 15 to 34. So um, we have to start thinking who are we going to work with to apply that use of technology, internet, social media for international trade purposes, not just to um, socialize and, and, and send uh, emails, but rather to uh, grasp opportunities from in international trade. And I'll tell you in a few minutes what we've done about it or what we're trying to do from, from the IDB side. Um, internet users spend on average in, in our region 10 hours per month, that's twice as much as the rest of the world, on services like Facebook, LinkedIn, and especially Twitter. Um, so the... As a whole, it's really um, the region is one of the fastest growing e-commerce uh, markets in the world, and the, there are several uh, statistics to, to sustain that. What we've done is, uh, from the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, um, we've worked uh, trade integration is part of our genesis, is part of a, our, our founding uh, mission in, in, in development, and, and we work with SMEs and, and with international trade, um, but we wanted to see what we you know, given this scenario, what else can be done? What more innovative approach can be done? So we were working for almost two years doing focus groups in the regions with SMEs, with exporters, or with wannabe exporters, uh, or ex-exporters, their mortality rates and all. And um, the conclusion was that they faced three main barriers. One is um, information. It's not easy to export. Yeah, for us, you know, in Washington with PhDs, with masters in international economics, trade development, we understand uh, the, the, the jargon, although the spaghetti bowl is, is, is hard. But uh, for an, a, an entrepreneur, an SME in, 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 in Honduras or in Guatemala, it's not easy. The information out there is very complex, very uh, difficult to digest. And uh, that was one, you know, not only the, the tariffs, uh, the, especially the non-tariff barriers, the, the standards, um, the, you know, the certifications, uh, the things you really need in order to acquire quality to be um, a, a sustainable exporter. So there was information, technical information as a barrier. Then the, uh, the barrier of the contacts, uh, who, uh, you know, the, the buyers, the investors, the potential partners, the, the multinational firms, and, and even in our region, the multilatinas, they have the financial resources and the muscle to have um, specialized commercial intelligence departments that develop networks of contacts. For the smaller players, it's, it's much harder. It's, it's very hard, and trust there becomes uh, very important. And then, Access to finance, access to credit, financial resources, uh, which of course is a is a, a barrier, especially for the smaller and, and medium companies. So we put together all those elements that internet usage in, in our region was growing so much and we're avid social media users, yet the smaller players are not exporting as much as they could. 
Um, and then these barriers that we encountered with focus groups on the ground, having interviewed hundreds, um, thousands of, of um, small and medium companies. So we, we partnered up with, um, with Google, with uh, DHL, with Alibaba.com and, and Visa, and we created a social network for um, businesses, the first social network for, uh, for businesses, which is connectamericas.com. Uh, you have Facebook for the individuals to socialize. Uh, you have LinkedIn for the professionals to network. And this is a social network for companies to basically try to overcome these three barriers. So it's three words for those three barriers. Learn, connect, finance. Um, so in, in learn, there's content uh, necessary for exporters uh, to access, to interpret, to understand in a very easy way with a lot of data visual visualization and, and in, in, in three languages. Language, of course, is a, is a barrier, but you have it in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. And with the Google tools, you can translate it to every language because the, we, we have the Google Translate there incorporated in the platform. So you have information um, with the learn. Then you have connect. And connect is really what I think we think it's the most innovative approach because it's really the social media aspect within the platform. You can find companies, you can find profiles, you can find entrepreneurs, see what they're doing. You can send them emails within the platform. You can rank your exchanges so it gives credibility and transparency to the platform. We do verification. We verify each company that, is, that comes in. And so that connect in, in, Pillar is the one that is, has shown most usage and, and, and popularity. Hmm. And then there's the finance. Uh, finance is access uh, to an easy access to the banks, uh, the private banks, as well as the multilateral like us, that provide lending, direct lending for um, export or, uh, apart from trade financing, just um, various technical assistance uh, programs that are, are out there to do that. Uh, for the export purposes. So I do think there is a big role for multilateral development banks, for the trade promotion organizations. This is not done on our own. This is done in close collaboration and alliance uh, with the TPOs and the chambers of commerce of the Latin America, of the Americas, and also outside as well. So we have, for example, if you're looking to uh, buy quinoa, which is actually booming, and there's not enough quinoa, and the price has gone up like crazy, and uh, it's, 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 it's really something, that product, uh, you can search there in Connect Americas, uh, you are a buyer of quinoa. And then, if Bolivia, which is a big producer, um, has the information, then you are in the trade promotion agency of Bolivia in the online information that, they, that it has on the price, on the suppliers, if they do. That's called the functional integration. So we're functionally integrated with the chambers of commerce and with the trade promotion organizations of, of the region, but also outside in, in, in Europe and in China and uh, in Hong Kong, in Korea, and uh, now in the future in Japan, because those are our three shareholders at the IDB from, from Asia. Um, so we think there is a role for the governments to do promotion, to overcome these asymmetries of information, uh, of access to finance. We are a contributing element to that. We're not the panacea, we're not going to solve all the problems, but we are working very intensely with uh, Uruguay 21, Pro Chile, Pro Mexico, Pro Export Colombia, and all the rest in the region in order to um, really uh, try to exploit this technological developments uh, so that the smaller players um, can, uh, can export, can become global players. And it's not only direct exports. Many times it's indirect exports through the supply chains as well. So that's, uh, that's uh, we also think, um, really important. We're excited because we see, not in theory, in practice, we see a lot of vibrancy and energy. In the first six months since we launched, it, we have 17,000 registered users. LinkedIn in the first six months had 30,000. And we've had more than 110,000 unique visitors. So there is undoubtedly, a, there is a curiosity, there is demand for this a, type of platform. 
in order to be sustained, you have to innovate and you have to make sure that it accomplishes actual specific results. And the metrics and the evaluation and the monitoring mechanisms become key, especially to report to our shareholders, which are funding uh, this, both public donors and private companies, because these companies have put resources in kind uh, through experts, but also financial. And of course, we want more of that because uh, we are in a startup mode and we face limited resources. Uh, so we really have to show that this is, um, this is working. Uh, but from our experience in the ground uh, and talking to many uh, companies, they need uh, this type of, of supports. So. Fabrizio, thank you so much. That was a great, very tangible example that for, I thought brought all of your presentations together beautifully. Um, before I open up for a question uh, period, Katya, I just want to give you a quick second to, if you want to respond to any of the uh, comments. We don't often do a peer review paper, you know, as a panel discussion. I think we should do it more often. It's wonderful. Uh, but Katya, I wanted to give you a chance if you wanted to have any response back to the three presentations, and then we'll start the Q&A. Um, all of you from different angles, and perhaps what Fabrice is talking about, Connect Americas, is really bringing together a lot of the elements that perhaps this A for E trade initiative would bring, public-private partnership, very tangible objectives of helping SMEs uh, grow globally, and, and certainly, you know, uh, catalyze the digital economy that Jen you're, and, and Josh, you were talking about, because this is not only about e-commerce. Certainly, you know, if we were to adopt this kind of an initiative, it would help a lot of different players, a lot of different aspects. It would definitely catalyze the internet. Everything, it would be just, you know, um, useful for, for a number of different players and a number of different um, uh, areas, like finance, uh, for instance, for, for small companies. So uh, uh, appreciate very much the, the comments. And, and uh, I think the matrix are key. Like, the goal is absolutely critical. Uh, what we've seen in the Aid for Trade initiative is that uh, typically, you know, the annual gains are something like 3% extra trade for, for, uh, for the spending, uh, whatever the amount of spending is. So there are some, some um, you can measure those with econometric tools and whatnot, but that sounds pretty dry. So I would, I would imagine setting a goal like having double uh, the um, e-commerce transactions and double the participation of SMEs uh, beyond what the forecasts currently show. So if we, if we you know, invest $100 billion, then we double uh, what's, currently, what's currently being expected in the next 10 years. That could, that could perhaps focus minds and be, be quite exciting as a target. Fantastic. Well, before I uh, start the question and answer period, let me throw out a, a question. I think uh, we really, Josh, we're making that assumption that this is, although the business to business, we know the larger businesses are, are in the space and doing significant things, but it's unleashing the individual, the micro-multinational, that is a great phrase, um, and, and how dramatic that is. Now, but that, what we're finding in both this project and, as Katya mentioned, sort of a subsequent pro project looking at the security of that and how do you unleash that micro-multinational uh, that has no clue all of the, the export control issues, the customs barriers, the physical security of moving product uh, across border. Um, you know, that for me is, is our biggest challenge. And I, I agree, I think po from the policy agenda, the individual isn't even part of this conversation at all. Yet we see these extraordinary figures, Latin America, Turkey, other, I mean, it's just the growth here is unbelievable. That also unleashes, from a policy perspective, the power of the individual of making choices and that, that uh, com competition, if you will, between the power of the individual and then the, the governing space that it's in. So I just welcome just sort of a rapid fire, um, Kati, join in here as well. Sort of how do you, how do you tackle this from a you know, 30,000 level policy agenda that's really talking about that individual in Oklahoma that finds a buyer in Brazil and trying to make that work and grow. How, do, how does that reflect it in a policy agenda? Or we just can't get there yet. There's too many bigger issues in the larger trading agenda that we can't even focus on the individual. Patty, I'll just work our way down. Everyone can have a whack at that. Yeah. <laughs> or anybody who wants a whack at it. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Quickly, yeah, I think this is, uh, Heather, you put your finger on it, and it's not only if the importer is, the, um, is, is an individual, it certainly affects also the, the bigger companies that Josh, you were talking about. Take Walmart. Uh, Walmart is not present in India, but they, at least to my knowledge, they haven't come back, but, but they do sell uh, online to Indian consumers so, or, or businesses. So there are a number of issues also for the larger companies that are very much part of the trade uh, discussion. And perhaps it's something that Heather, you and I have been talking about is, is using, and Jen, you alluded to this, using technology to, to give a voice to the smaller players and give them capabilities. Uh, for instance, for trade compliance, the tools that we have currently, pretty rudimentary. Uh, Customs and Border Protection have done wonderful things here, but, but there are still a number of improvements that can be made um, in order to facilitate the trade compliance and, and understanding of smaller players about the complexity of, of trade rules. Um, and, um, and that's de definitely something that can be done with, with much more sophisticated tools like uh, Connect Americas is a, is a great example of that. Um, so, you know, I think, I think uh, I just want to actually pick up probably part of what Fabrizio was saying, I think this is partly an export promotion agency issue. Um, you know, because if you see, you know, there's this sort of tension in the, re in the allocation of resources, I think, in the sense between the, um, you know, the extent that export promotion agencies um, want to help um, companies that have some experience already um, with exporting um, and what's becoming this opportunity where individuals and very small companies can go global quickly and in, so and, and part and often that's you know can be in a very explicit motivation of someone starting a business I mean whether we're talking about in Latin America or in more developed parts of the world um, you know and particularly in the appropriate age um, bracket which is you know um, increasingly digitally sophisticated that people start businesses now thinking globally from the from the get-go and so you know what's the space there for export promotion agencies and helping individuals who haven't yet demonstrated their capacity to export and the Connect Americas is a great example and um, I'm actually you know what want to learn more about it I, I was aware of it um, but you look at say businessusa.gov which is being, just been launched, which is yeah. you know collecting the work of you know all export promotion agencies and other government agencies in the US on one website, which will facilitate I think that process. Um, and you look around the world, there's a, 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 a process underway in Copenhagen in Denmark called Match SME, um, which is um, an online platform which is matching um, essentially. Uh, small service providers with businesses, and you look at in Canada's got this thing called CDMN uh, Network, which is a soft landing program for startups, um, helping them go go international. So, I think you know, part of the answer, at least, is um, export promotion agencies a becoming aware that the internet's enabling this, and then having the tools in place. I think to to make it happen. Well, as you say, we're going, you know, from the forest down to the <laughs> down to the blade of grass. Um, look, I think I think for smaller companies, you know, run by one or two people, you're absolutely right. They don't have time to engage in the policy issues, and 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 it really is going to be the multinational companies that that once were small companies, um, right? Cisco's only 30 years old, so. We, we still remember, I, I was struck actually when I started the company about 10 years ago, um, how there still was this feeling of being a small company, even though you know we have 70,000 employees. There's a lot of greenfield. Um, but the point is a company, a company like Cisco can invest in policy people like myself, um, but there are also the ITACs, the, the um, uh, international Trade Advisory Committees. I believe that commerce spends quite a bit of time trying to attract small businesses to participate in the ITAC process. Um, so we need to really educate small businesses. That should be part of your commons to talk about. Want to get involved? Want to get? You know? Want to make sure your voice is heard with respect to um, how these policies? They're not. They're not just um, static things. We are very fortunate in this country that um, you know, we're, we're a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and, um, and people can get involved. So 
um, perhaps that could be one way to, to add to your comments so that we do get the voice of the small business person all the way up to the tree level um, into, the, into the policies. Just a quick two finger on your ITAC comment. I don't believe, but please correct me if I'm wrong, there is an ITAC that is focused solely on the e commerce. There is. There is. There is yeah, one. It's ITAC 8. ITAC 8. It's e commerce, IT, and um, uh, services. So it's it's a number, but. Yeah, it's, um, a, it's a bringing a whole bunch of issues together. Beca because of the ecosystem nature of this type of industry. Yeah, I. <clears throat> on your on your comment, Heather, on your question, um, you were saying the power of the, of the individual. I would say the power of the entrepreneur, yeah. and I think we have to empower those entrepreneurs with with, with good ideas that and making it um, easy or at least less difficult for them to conquer the, the the markets. For that, we believe and we're very committed from that. Uh, our development agenda in trade from, from the IDB uh, with the work of the trade promotion organizations in, in our region. We work with literally all of them. Um, from Haiti, uh, where uh, we've gathered some really tangible impacts. We worked in Haiti together, and, uh, and you know we built an industrial park there. There's a huge textile operation even after the earthquake that came employs 3,000 people they are doing uh, there's contact center operations there mm -hmm. uh, to Chile and, and Uruguay and Colombia where we're working in other sectors as well so what do they have to do these trade promotion organizations training lots of training and provide uh, online training in order for exporters to keep up to date with all the uh, regulations procedures and going beyond FDA Yes, it's fine, yeah, the FDA uh, has uh, its very own stringent rules for if, uh, to import food in the U.S., and, but then it's how Walmart buys, how Costco buys, how Safeway buys, those private standards. Walmart, by the way, is the first individual employer in Latin America. <laughs> Walmart, <laughs> uh, 450,000 people. Uh, so streamlining procedures, making it easier, the one-stop shops we're doing, Ventanillas Unicas de Comercio Exterior, the buses, the, which we're funding, those one-stop shops to export and making it much, much easier. I think it's, it's very important. Uh, and information, information is key. And I think in, in the future, and we're thinking about this, the sharing economy, the Uber of international trade. There's a lot of lost value when a, a container goes half empty or when Walmart says, yes, I like your gluten-free crackers, but I need um, four containers. And the company cannot do that. But if in association with others, they can do sharing. They can do associative partnerships in order to confront more scale. And that's a question of information. Uh, information standards and, and very uh, punctual and specific and precise information. So, there's a lot of lost value that can be captured, and the entrepreneurs are very much aware of this. And increasingly, you see, we see in the international trade events that we organize. In the past six weeks, we did an infrastructure investment event in Miami with 600 entrepreneurs. Four weeks ago, we did one in Changsha in China with 2,500 Latin Americans, 1,500 Chinese. Three weeks ago, we did uh, lack flavors for the food sector, gluten-free, organic, fair trade, uh, kosher, halal, all those niches that are growing much in the markets. And last week, we did outsource to Latin America. So we've been quite busy. And what you see from interviewing all these companies that participate, because we organize matchmaking meetings, is that they collaborate. And many of the deals that are being done are being done together as they associate with each other. And so we have to give more incentives for that. There's not enough stimuli for that. Corfo in Chile, they do a very good job, the development institution, Bank of Chile, um, for this, um, with, with specific incentives, direct assistance for associative ventures in order to, to export, uh, to share the costs or of a marketing expertise in a certain market. I think we have to think about that, empowering the, the entrepreneurs and empowering them, collaboration amongst themselves. I love the idea of Uber for con shipping containers. That's a <laughs> phenomenal idea. We have a, uh, some time for a few questions. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, we'll take the lady down there and then sir you. 
Please. Uh, oh, if you could please identify yourself. Sure. Okay. I'm Erin Ending with Corona Corporation. I've worked with uh, Kati before, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I thought it was a fantastic presentation and really interesting research. I look, uh, look forward to looking at the paper in, in um, greater depth. Um, just by way of background, I've been managing USAID trade capacity building projects for about uh, 15 years or so. And so it's through that lens that I'm, that I'm hearing this and I'm really finding it very exciting. And so um, I, I think it's a huge opportunity for developing countries and especially for small and medium enterprises. And I agree with Fabricio's comments that it, it could very well be sort of turning on its head all preconceived notions about SMEs and, and how large their contribution can be. Um, I also appreciated the fact that we're not talking about exports of goods or trade in goods only. We're also talking about trade in services. And Fabrizio, I heard your example about the Uruguayan um, firm. <clears throat> also agree uh, it's a huge opportunity for public-private partnership, and that's what development um, is about right now. And probably for the you know indefinite foreseeable uh, future. So um, I had actually you know, a comment and a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Because um, I, think, I think the donors um, in general are going to be embracing, you know, embracing this paper and these ideas very enthusiastically. And I wondered if, um, if you've actually, my, one of my questions is, have you, you know, in, had some initial conversations with the OECD and the WTO and, and donors, um, and how are they reacting to this notion? Um, because I really do think it could be a game changer for the way that trade capacity building um, is, is um, done in the future. And um, so that's, that's one question. Um, and kind of a relation, a, a, a related one is, um, I'm wondering if the doing business um, indicators might conceivably be tweaked to include indicators of e-commerce e readiness. Um, I would think that'd be kind of interesting. Um, and then um, another question I had was just looking at the chart that you have, the World Economic Forum chart, which is um, the scatter plot. I thought that was really fascinating and to, and to think about um, how donors fit in. Many of the donors do tend to focus, not necessarily AID, but a lot of the regional development banks and multilateral development banks um, tend to focus on infrastructure. And I worry about um, uh, funding going, you know, that essentially pushes uh, countries from, uh, you know, from uh, bottom to top, but without advancing in their economic impact. And um, would like to rather think about how we can um, either move them, you know, um, diagonally or just looking at examples. Uh, for example, Lesotho and Laos. They have basically the same level of ICT infrastructure, but the impacts are much greater for Laos than Lesotho. And why, why is that? How can we, without spending a lot of money on infrastructure, how can we move you know, horizontally? So, um, and then my only comment would be just, um, I want to make sure that although we talk about the power of exports, that, um, that capacity building relating to E-Trade um, is sort of neutral on the import and export side. And um, so, yeah, just, that's just my comment. <laughs> Thank you, wonderful question. Sir, we'll have you give you the last question and then we'll let our panelists respond. Or you just have to push the microphone down. Yeah, perfect. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, what is being done to get uh, meetings together over the internet to fund some of this effort and get agreement on it? I think we'll just go down the line, and we have about five more minutes. Uh, Erin, thank you, and thanks for coming, and um, thanks for all the work we've done together. It's been it's been great. We actually work together on A for Trade uh, related issues, so a lot of the insight comes from comes from that. Um, you know, we haven't had any. This is ki kind of the release of the paper. We haven't had any formal conversations yet. Uh, we've had a working group here um, as a paving the uh, way for this paper. And uh, we did have partners from the World Bank. We've kept uh, IDB abreast, uh, Fabrizio and his colleagues. Um, and um, I'm actually presenting this at the World Bank tomorrow. There is a, a roundtable for the for the global trade practice. 
So uh, uh, hopefully something will come out of that. And, and certainly, you know, USAID we're very much would welcome uh, collaboration. We're uh, hoping they could join us. A lot of people just traveling. Um, the same with World Bank. A lot of, a lot of people are stuck in meetings today, but they've been, they've been very uh, enthused. Um, at, at this point, at least, if I just talk from my per personal perspective, um, tying some of the indicators to doing business, it's a good idea. I, th I think that's a, a good platform for doing some of it. Uh, another platform is enterprise surveys, which are the firm level surveys. And, and as I look at the, and Josh, you may also have comments on this, but as I look at the landscape of data on this uh, in this area, there's a lot of gaps in data, but particularly there are gaps in, in the firm level uh, understanding at the firm level the ICT usage, uh, e-commerce usage, and at the transaction level. So, uh, of course, the tr transaction data is, is um, uh, there is some in, in with eBay, and we're looking to perhaps expand some of the work uh, with them in that direction. Um, and yeah, infrastructure has been a big, big one for aid for aid for trade. Uh, certainly, and maybe you know this idea here is that yeah, we need infrastructure and ICT as well. But uh, the key is really some of these, um, you know, we can leapfrog maybe some of the infrastructure hurdles. Um, technology is advancing, um, and, and we can probably do more with less uh, in the future. But the key is really this e-training, e-learning, these aspects that Fabrizio has highlighted that really have been useful for, or also for Latin American companies. It just sounds so very simple that, hey, I'm going to put my product up out there in the and the cyberspace, and all of a sudden it gets sold globally. Well, certainly you can get discovered, but as competition intensifies, as more and more companies around the world uh, get online and start selling their products, it's even harder to, to stand out. So how do you do that? You have to be very strategic. You have to understand uh, uh, advertisement online, marketing, social media, uh, using social media to, to push your product, uh, label products, price products, all of these things. It's a very complex endeavor, not unlike exporting per se. It's just easier for you to get, get discovered. So I think there's a lot of kind of capacity building uh, at, the, at the ground level and, and certainly with the, with the uh, export promotion agencies play a key role as, as Josh highlighted. So, so um, uh, I'll, leave it at, I'll leave it at that. And definitely uh, on the import side, Something, uh, this, this was very pro-export uh, kind of a presentation, but as we look at the import side, e-commerce has also enabled companies to access inputs uh, at much lower prices, much more efficient inputs at world prices, um, because it also gives, gives them the visibility of, of, uh, of sellers, and platforms like Alibaba are very powerful for this, so there's probably going to be much more on the import side as well. well it's very striking to me that a country like China is in between these two bubbles, yeah. right? Um, why isn't China way up and to the right, given you know, the size of their economy and um, the fact that they're the largest um, trader of ICT in the world, um, both on the import and the export side? And uh, to me, uh, it's because of some of the rigidity in terms of um, how technology can be used in China um, and what types of technologies can be used in China. And um, are the, is the technology being placed in its, in a, in its most productive use, right? So um, while we see that there is a lot of technology and a lot of infrastructure in China, it's not necessarily deployed in the most efficient way um, to cause the greatest economic impact. And so I think they're absolutely, you don't just, you know, sort of throw technology at countries and, and say, okay, great, go for it. Um, it's really talking about how do you transform your entire economy by infusing technology throughout your economy into your businesses. So we focus a lot on the individual and connecting the individual, and that's great, but there, that's, that's one of the reasons that I talked about sort of the machine-to-machine -machine, um, types of transactions, the, the people to machine types of transactions and the people to people transactions um, because that's really where the productivity lies is in connecting those high value um, types of connections. Yeah, just to compliment on that briefly, um, we talk about the hardware and the software of economic integration. So you have the best roads, but if they 
you reach the country and the lines for the trucks are 48 hours, it's not good to have the best roads. You need the, the software, the processes online, in place so as to facilitate trade. And the, the same holds for, for broadband and ICT. You can have the best infrastructure, but if the people are not literate in the use of internet and there is not enough incentives and information out there, um, then it can be um, a bad thing. And so um, you cannot, um, you cannot ignore, it's really multi-dimensional, like you were saying, Jennifer, the way you deploy it in terms of the infrastructure, but then in terms of the know-how, the processes, and the information needed in order to use that broadband to um, export. Right. Well, for a non-trade expert, I found this conversation really fascinating, interesting. I think it's, it's for me, it's opening my eyes into an area that just needs continued exploration. Great examples, great public-private partnerships, and great new ideas, Kati, with your working paper. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. We're going to have another paper that will be coming out uh, with early 2015 that looks at the security for trade and it's all that facilitation but again down to that trying the power of that entrepreneur and that micro multinational uh, but uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific discussion. <laughs>